This is uh, Tuesdays with Maury. Um, I apologize, my jaw is hurting really bad because it's like swollen. The back of my uh, head is hurting bad because a security guard threw a huge rock in the back of it and busted it open. Oh. All right, but um, I want to get through this because today is Tuesday morning. And we're reading Tuesdays with Maury. The first Tuesday, this chapter is the first Tuesday we talk about the world. Connie opened the door and let me in. Maury was in his wheelchair by the kitchen table wearing a loose cotton shirt and even looser black sweatpants. They were loose because his legs had atrophied beyond normal clothing size. You could get two hands around his thighs and have your fingers touch. Had he been able to stand, he'd been no more than five feet tall and he'd probably have fit in a sixth grader's jeans. I got you something, I announced, holding up a brown paper bag. I had stopped on my way from the airport at a nearby supermarket and purchased some turkey, potato salad, macaroni salad, and bagels. I knew there was plenty of food at the house, but I wanted to contribute something. I was so powerless to help Maury otherwise, and I remembered his fondness for eating. Ah, so much food, he sang. Well, now you have to eat it with me. We sat at the kitchen table, surrounded by wicker chairs. This time, without the need to make up 16 years of information, we slid quickly into the familiar waters of our old college dialogue. Maury asking questions, listening to my replies, stopping like a chef to sprinkle in something I've forgotten or hadn't realized. He asked about the newspaper strike. In true to form, he couldn't understand why both sides didn't simply communicate with each other and solve their problems. I told him that not everyone was as smart as he was. Occasionally, he had to stop to use the bathroom, a process that took some time. Connie would wheel him to the toilet, then lift him from the chair and support him as he urinated into the beaker. Each time he came back, he looked tired. Do you remember when I told Ted Koppel that pretty soon someone was going to have to wipe my ass, he said? I laughed. Ha <laughs> ha. You don't forget a moment like that. Well, I think that day is coming. That one bothers me. Why? Because it's the ultimate sign of dependency. Someone wiping your bottom. But I'm working on it. I'm trying to enjoy the process. Enjoy it? Yes, after all, I get to be a baby one more time. That's a unique way of looking at it. Well, I have to look at life uniquely now. Let's face it, I can't go shopping. I can't take care of the bank accounts. I can't take out the garbage. But I can sit here with my dwindling days and look at what I think is important in life. I have both the time and the reason to do that. So, I said in a reflexively cynical response, I guess the key to finding the meaning of life is to stop taking out the garbage. He laughed, and I was relieved that he did. As Connie took the plates away, I noticed a stack of newspapers that had obviously been read before I got there. You bother keeping up with the news, I asked. Yes, Maury said. Do you think that's strange? Do you think because I'm dying I shouldn't care what happens in this world? Maybe. He sighed. Maybe you're right. Maybe I shouldn't care. After all, I won't be around to see how it all turns out. But it's hard to explain, Mitch. Now that I'm suffering, I feel closer to people who suffer than I ever did before. The other night on TV, I saw people in Bosnia running across the street, getting fired upon, killed, innocent victims, and I just started to cry. I feel the anguish as if it were my own. I don't know any of these people, but how can I put this? I'm almost drawn to them. His eyes got moist, and I tried to change the subject, but he dabbed his face and waved it off. I cry all the time, he said. Never mind. Amazing, I thought. I worked in the news business. I covered stories where people died. I interviewed grieving family members. I even attended the funerals. I never cried. Maury, for the suffering of people half a world away, was weeping. Is this what comes at the end, I wondered? Maybe death is the great equalizer, the one big thing that can finally make strangers shed a tear for one another. Maury honked loudly into the tissue. This is okay with you, isn't it? Men crying? Sure, I said, too quickly. He grinned. Ah, Mitch, I'm going to loosen you up. One day I'm going to show you it's okay to cry. Yeah, yeah, I said. Yeah, yeah, he said. We laughed because we used to say the same thing nearly 20 years earlier. Mostly on Tuesdays, in fact. Tuesdays had always been our day together. Most of our courses with Maury were on Tuesdays. He had his office hours on Tuesdays, and I wrote, when I wrote my senior thesis, which was pretty much Maury's suggestion right from the start, it was on Tuesdays that we sat together by his desk or in his cafeteria or on the steps of Perlman Hall, going over the work. So it seemed only fitting that we were back together on Tuesday, here in the house with a Japanese maple out front. As I ready to go, I mentioned this to Mori. We're Tuesday people, he said. Tuesday people, I repeated. Mori smiled. 
Mitch, Mitch, you asked about caring for people. I don't even know, but I can tell you the thing I've learned most with this disease. What's that? The most important thing in life is to learn how to give out love and to let it come in. His voice dropped to a whisper. Let it come in. We think we don't deserve love. We think if we let it in, we'll become too soft. But a wise man named Levine said it right. He said, love is the only rational act. He repeated it carefully, pausing for effect. Love is the only rational act. Love is the only rational act. I nodded like a good student. He excelled weakly. I leaned over to give him a hug, and then, although it's not really like me, I kissed him on the cheek. I felt his weakened hands on my arm, the thin stubble of his whiskers brushing my face. So you'll come back next Tuesday, he whispered. He enters the classroom, sits down, doesn't say anything. He looks at us, we look at him. At first there are a few giggles, but Maury only shrugs, and eventually a deep silence falls. We begin to notice the smallest sounds, the radiator humming, humming in the corner of the room, the nasal breathing of one of the fat students. Some of us are agitated. When is he going to say something? We squirm, check our watches. A few students look out the window, trying to be above it all. This goes on for a good 15 minutes before Maury finally breaks in with a whisper. What's happening here? He asks. And slowly a discussion begins, as Maury has always wanted along. As Maury has, has wanted all along. About the effect of silence on human relations. Why are we embarrassed by silence? What comfort do we find in all this noise? I am not bothered by silence. For all the noise I make with my friends, I am still not comfortable talking about my feelings in front of others, especially not classmates. I could sit in the quiet for hours if that is what the class demanded. On my way out, Maury stops me. You didn't say much today, he remarks. Uh, I don't know, I just didn't have anything to add. I think you have a lot to add. In fact, Mitch, you remind me of someone I knew who also liked to keep things to himself when he was younger. Who? Me. That was Tuesdays with Maury, the first Tuesday <clears throat> we talk about the world. My name is Gregory Brantz, and I am uh, reading from uh, my apartment in Waikiki, Hawaii. Aloha.